Hello everyone, I'm Nick Hopwood. This is a video that's going to explain three different kinds of randomization or randomness and why they can be really important or valuable to us, particularly in social science research. I should warn you that well, the video is going to cover three ideas but in a very basic way. I'm trying to keep this video nice and short. Nonetheless, although these ideas are simple, their implications are very profound. And even those of you who are a bit more leaning towards the qualitative side, it's very important to understand the idea of randomness or randomization and how valuable it can be to us. For those of you who are going to join me in a subject here at UTS, uh, this will be taken up in uh, the classes that we talk about. Those of you who may be joining me in a workshop somewhere else, the same will apply. I'll be hoping that you'll be able to build on these ideas when we meet or discuss online. For those of you who are just watching this video via YouTube from somewhere else, I hope it's useful and as always I welcome your comments, constructive criticisms on the uh, chance in the comments below on the video. So what I'm going to do is just show you three different pictures which I've drawn uh, by hand. The first one and the first kind of randomization is what I call the heads or tails approach to randomization or for those of you who are familiar with Australia the two up approach. Two up is a game which involves flipping three coins. In this one we can look at the top left of this picture and we can see a lot of different black dots. Imagine they might be research participants and for every dot we flip a coin. We either get heads or tails. Heads is indicated in the red, tails is indicated in green and so we have for every single dot we flip the coin and so there are multiple random events. Each coin flip is a random event. The chance of heads happening or tails happening is exactly the same every time. So through that we can create two identical groups. Now I know the colours are different here but that's just to show the group that was created because of the tails outcome and the group that was created out of the heads outcome. If we have enough of these random events, if we flip the coin enough times and we have enough participants, we can assume that those groups are, to all intents and purposes, identical in every way. That means they, anything that might influence an outcome if we want to then go and apply a treatment or an intervention to one group and not the other, or different treatments, we can say any differences that we observe later at the group level are because of that intervention and not because of any differences between the groups. And they might be differences we know about or differences we don't know about. A very famous example of this is the High Scope Perry project where they randomly allocated a number of people, I think the sample is about 140, to, uh, young children in, around Detroit in the 1950s to either receive nursery education or not to. And the two groups they got, the one that got the nursery education and the one that didn't, they could assume they were identical in terms of the kinds of parents they had, any genetic uh, makeup of that population, chances of disease, the sorts of friendships groups they have, all those things that might affect educational outcomes, we can assume were evenly spread across both groups. They both had an even chance of getting into each group. And therefore any differences in the outcomes that they observe in educational attainment, in employment, in crime, in arrests and things like that, you can attribute to that intervention which was giving nursery education to one group or another. This is a very tricky thing to get your head around and it's quite amazing. At the moment I just want to explain this kind of randomness. So here this is what we might call a true experiment or a randomised control trial. Now it's not always necessarily a heads or a tails and I expect researchers don't usually flip coins. There are other ways of generating random outcomes. You may be creating three groups or four. But the point is for each different dot there is a random event. So the groups are created through random, multiple random events. On the right hand side of the screen what you can see is two existing groups, the purple dots and the blue dots, and you might just flip a coin to say which one of them gets the treatment. I might say, I, I might be teaching a subject with a colleague and we might be interested in what if we play music in class, will that help students? And So we take my class and my colleague's class, we flip a coin and it turns out to be my colleague's class that gets the treatment, the music. In this case we haven't created the groups through random events, multiple random events. We've taken existing groups and just randomly allocated one to an experiment condition and one to a control condition. This is not a true experiment. This is what you might call a quasi-experiment. It's using randomness to choose which group gets an intervention. We're not using randomness to create two identical groups. In the second example, we can't assume the groups are the same, so we have to do a lot of extra work to make sure that any differences we observe after the intervention are because of the intervention, and not just because the groups were different in the first place. For example, my colleague's group could have people who were more receptive to music or 
smarter or uh, um, different things that could affect their outcomes. So creating groups through lots of random events, the heads or tails approach, and taking existing groups and flipping a coin or randomly allocating them to a treatment is not a true experiment. It's what you call a quasi-experiment. Now, randomness and random selection happen very, very differently when you're talking about sampling. And I use the idea of equal chances. And I would deem myself to be a lazy academic. Imagine I had a population. You can see it on the left there. I wanted to know what the mean math score was for all undergraduates in my university. One way to do it would be to test all the maths undergrad, all the undergraduates in maths, score all their tests and calculate the mean. But I'm lazy. I want to do it with fewer than the population. I want to take a sample and to know that my answer from the sample will tell me a good enough reading about what the answer would have been if I went from the population. In this case, a completely random sample means that everybody in the population has an equal chance of becoming part of my sample. So that's why I've called it the equal, equal chances sampling method. So we have all the dots there on the left. <coughs> they all, none of them are more likely than the others to become part of my sample. We have picked them at random. Now you might want to stratify a random sample. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, if your original population had fewer men than women, or you wanted to make sure that typically underrepresented groups were included where they might fall out, you might choose to overrepresent some, or to make sure that you took a certain percentage of females and the same percentage of males, so that you would make sure that the male-female balance in your sample was the same as it was in the population. But this is all about, the basic idea is equal chances. The participants in your study have an equal chance of becoming a member of your sample from the population. And if that is the case, then the answer we get from our sample about the mean math score in my example would be, statistically, we could be very confident that would be able to say that the population mean would be very, very close to the mean we've had from our sample because everybody had an equal chance of getting into the sample. Third kind of randomness is random clusters. And this is another hard one to get your head around. Often we mistake randomness for evenness. So here we have on the left some red dots, and you can see they're not all the same distance apart. That's not an even distribution. I've tried to draw it to look like what we might expect of a random distribution. We can think if we threw a whole load of marbles up in the air, they wouldn't all land in the same place. Randomness is not the same as evenness. A random distribution would be very, very unlikely to be completely evenly distributed. But when we look at, the, imagine these red dots were on a map and they were instances of something like a cancer or a disease that people didn't want to get. Now, you might draw a blue line around those red dots at the bottom and say, that's a bad place to live. Look at the people there. They seem much more likely to get cancer than the people elsewhere. And in a sense, that's true. There are more incidences of that disease in that particular area than in the same circle drawn around any other part of that uh, diagram. But does that mean that living there in that particular area causes you to have more of those more likely to, to have cancer? Maybe not. It may be, but it may be not. It may be that just that cluster is what we'd expect if it was random. It has nothing to do with that suburb or that neighbourhood or anything else. Now, statistics knows what randomness looks like. Curiously, they actually often use um, calculations of pi up to the first two million digits, I think, uh, to find out how to generate things according to randomness. Statistics can tell us if we could expect a cluster like this to be random or whether it's actually a thing. So I've called it the is it a thing kind of version of randomization. Are those four dots on the blue circle there something that we could expect in a random distribution or is there something strange going on with disease in that part of a suburb? Interestingly, in London, that was one of the key ways in which they uh, managed public health and hygiene was by looking at clusters of um, instances of disease and uh, linking them to um, water taps. And so they managed to uh, get a sense of waterborne disease. So we would want to know where clusters are. Clusters can often be interesting, but we want to make sure that we're not taking a cluster as a thing when actually it's not a thing at all and it's just due to randomness. This came up in a debate in the BBC about the instance of disease in a particular county. and People said, oh, you're twice as likely to get this disease if you live there. And it was true that the two times more people were getting that disease than in other counties. But when the statisticians looked at it, they said, actually, this is no different from what we expect from a random distribution of that disease. Randomness means you'll always get some things occurring more in some places than others. So a summary. We have 
the heads or tails approach or the two up approach if you're Australian perhaps. This is about trials or experiments and we use lots of random events to create sameness, to create identical groups so that any differences after we've given one of them or more of them an intervention or a treatment can be attributed to that intervention or treatment and we can assume that all the groups are the same to start off with. The key question to ask here is how many random events were there? Was there a coin flip or another random event for every single participant or did you take two existing groups and just choose which one got the treatment? In the first you've got a true experiment on your hands, in the second you haven't. The second broader randomization approach is what I call the equal chances approach. You have a big population, you can't be bothered or you don't have the money or you're too lazy to look at everybody so you want to look at a subset of the population. It's loved by the lazy and we create samples so that we can generalize from our sample back to the population. And the point here is that through random selection from the population, everybody has an evil cha equal chance of being in the group, and so you allow that generalization to happen. The third kind of randomness is about random clusters, and the fact that random does not mean ev evenly spread. And so if you're looking at something and you find that three or four things or something's occurring more often somewhere than somewhere else, or in a particular time period than somewhere else, you can ask, is this any different from what I'd expect if it was random before you go assuming that something dodgy is going on? So, I hope that's been helpful. Those of you who are more statistically minded will very quickly be able to point out a number of limitations or flaws in what I've been saying, but I do believe I'm true to the core ideas about randomness. Flipping coins lots of times to create equal groups in a trial, equal chances of getting into a, a sample in a research so you can generalize back to your population and randomness in terms of understanding that randomness does not mean evenness and that if you have clusters of things or things are varied in their instance that we can use statistics and statistics knowledge of randomness to check if something interesting is actually happening or not. I hope you found this video useful and uh, look forward to talking to you about it if you're going to be joining me in class. Bye bye!